Databricks is available on all of the big three cloud providers, but not widely available beyond that. And what if you aren't using any of the big three for cloud hosting? And this might seem like a bit wild these days, but there are, for instance, a lot of organizations who are subject to rules, either internal or external, about where they can store and process data, particularly personal data, but or maybe in places where none of the big three are set up to do processing or storage. And some of these places might sound, you know, for us here in London, far flung, in Latin America or Southeast Asia, but some of them might be as close to home as the Channel Islands. Even closer to home than that, can you believe there are companies who do hosting in their own data centers? And here's a picture I took in the office earlier. All right, uh, it should be a familiar scene for most of you. But is anyone here using on-prem services at work? Yeah, almost everyone, right? And uh, in data centers or in colos or whatever. And what about data on-prem? People have data on-prem? Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, so it's not really that far-fetched. And finally, I want to touch on this question. And this is a hard one. So does, can you save money by self-hosting instead of using Databricks or Synapse or whatever? And I think it comes as a surprise to some like developers and data scientists that actually Databricks isn't free. Right? Uh, <laughs> and like many things in life, you have to pay for it. And that's it. I think for almost everyone, that complexity of managing you know, the fleet of VMs and making sure they're all working and on and patched and talking to each other and so on, this is quickly going to dwarf the cost savings from not paying for Databricks or Synapse. And I think if you're huge, like really huge, and the overhead of that management isn't a big deal, and also your data processing needs are huge, so you have a big bill to compare with, then maybe this thing might be worth considering on a cost basis. But for almost everyone, the cost justification is never going to be enough by itself. I think all of that said, having decided to embark on this path, how do we go about it? Well, the first option would be to get a load of com uh, computers and install Spark on it. And this is known as a standalone cluster. The advantage of this arrangement is that it is by far the simplest in terms of moving parts, how there are a number of drawbacks, namely that um, every job is going to get the same cluster configuration and there's no built-in uh, auto-scaling, to name just a few. As such, most self-hosted uh, Spark um, setups make use of the Yarn scheduler. The Yarn scheduler uh, comes from the Hadoop project and is why it's represented by these elephants here. We won't go into, it's also uh, uh, sub natively supported by Spark and so it's pretty wi well widely used. I won't dwell on this too long, but essentially Spark talks to the big elephant and then the big elephant talks to the little elephants and asks if they've got any time to do the work. It's a bit like when your project manager comes to you and asks if you have any spare capacity. You can, uh, this, the elephants aside, Yarn is how most self-hosted Spark setups are operated, included package, packaged versions from companies such as IBM and Cloudera. Indeed, some hosted solutions use Yarn scheduling, such as Spark for Azure Synapse. Yeah, I think it is still called that, right? I wasn't here for the keynote this morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, how it, Databricks themselves don't use it, as, and as part of their secret source, they have their very own scheduler, which I'm sure, with plenty of benefits that I'm sure they'd be happy to tell you plenty about. Um, but Spark also supports a third scheduler, namely Kubernetes. And so structurally, Kubernetes is similar to Yarn, um, essentially, but, but in this time, it's steering wheels and not elephants. And the big steering wheel talks to the little steering wheels, and so on. However, there are a couple of advantages in this setup that aren't on the slide. Namely, better isolation between jobs, which makes it easier to manage dependencies, and faster setup and teardown times for transient clusters, which are otherwise known as job clusters and Databricks. And everyone has heard of Kubernetes, right? Yes, right, yeah. <laughs> so why does everyone care so much about Kubernetes? Well, for any application, not just Spark, it has some advantages compared to running your workloads on a, a bunch of VMs. So Kubernetes is this kind of standardized open source platform, and the benefit of which is that it runs the same way everywhere. And that can be in the cloud, like Amazon or uh, AKS or with Google or some other smaller cloud provider, or even like on-prem on your servers or on your laptop. And the reason this is important, actually, is that not only can it help make your solution cloud agnostic if you care about 
cloud agnostic, right, it can also make your development cycle easier. And the, these managed services, the PaaS services we all like using, often have kind of imperfect or non-existent local emulation. So the choices are with that, well, we can develop in the cloud. And this sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? And it's a great idea that I think has never really caught on, despite like a decade of vendors banging the drum about it. Or we develop locally and live with the limitations about our local environment is not exactly the same as the cloud environment we deploy to. And Kubernetes also has kind of a standardized way of doing things, so that if I say, hey, Kubernetes, I want to create a thing or do a thing, this can generally be expressed in a similar way, whether the thing is a website or a database or some storage or whatever. And that way it looks like a YAML file or maybe a JSON file of this kind of predictable structure. And that's kind of abstract, and we're going to come back to that with an example. So generally, you can get better hardware utilization from containerized Kubernetes workloads than you can with VMs, you know, faster spin up and tear down and all that jazz. And the most important reason of all for embarking on the Kubernetes project is this. <laughs> so with that in mind, we called up the DevOps team, or rather the DevOps guild, and we said, we want a Kubernetes. And this is what they had to say. All right, uh, well, that isn't really what they had to say. All right, uh, so I think unless you have the kind of specialized skills and knowledge in this area, it probably isn't a great idea to download open source Kubernetes from the internet, install it on some servers, and use that to run your production workloads. You don't really have to do that anymore. Uh, even outside the big three, there's a bunch of VPS type hosting providers, the digital oceans and so on, that kind of have a managed Kubernetes service. And I think for those kinds of vendors, this is a good differentiator over maybe their peers who can't do that kind of thing. And even on-prem or in IaaS, you don't have to do Kubernetes the hard way now. And there are a bunch of package distributions, OpenShift, Rancher, uh, VMware, Tanzu. And that can take a lot of the stress out of managing Kubernetes for yourself and provide a more or less cloud-like experience on your own hardware. So unless you really know what you're doing, to do this in production, you probably want managed Kubernetes of some description. And for some years now, Spark has supported Kubernetes natively with this convenient syntax where we use Spark Submit and we specify everything you need to as arguments to the Spark Submit script, such as libraries, cluster configuration, secrets, and so on. And we can schedule these jobs using any general purpose scheduling tool. Oh, like SQL Server Agent. Well, maybe. But obviously, this approach of epic command lines can get a little bit messy. And if we want to make a change, it can be difficult to tell what's changed. It can be difficult to merge, and also, it can be very error prone. However, there is a better way, and that's the Spark Kubernetes operator. So this is a really wordy slide, right? Like, uh, but basically, a Kubernetes operator is a way of packaging a complex thing or application for use in Kubernetes. And this isn't packaging like Helm, where we have a script or a chart that goes and creates a load of Kubernetes resources. It's kind of more abstract, a custom resource, as if everything in that Helm chart has been packaged into a single object and then a controller, which is kind of like a service that can know about these objects and know how to create them when Kubernetes asks. So bearing in mind that Kubernetes is this desired state type of system, when Kubernetes says, I need three things, well, the operator just kind of knows how to go and create the three things. And Kubernetes says, no, I changed my mind. I only want two. It can probably destroy one without disrupting the other two. And that's super abstract. So let's look at a quick example. Here's an example um, from the Kubernetes documentation. It's a YAML, file, a YAML file, otherwise known as a manifest, and it creates some containers running Nginx, which is a web server. Now, Gemma's just mentioned controllers. And this manifest tells Kubernetes to talk to the deployment controller, which creates deployments. A deployment is a service uh, that creates some long-running workloads, in this case, a web server. Next, we have to tell the deployment controller what we actually want our deployments to look like, using this thing here called the spec. Here, the spec says to create two pods using pod definitions that have this Nginx tag. And then we create the definition here, where we say that the pod creates a container with, from the Nginx image and listens on port 80. So what does this all have to do with Spark? Well, in this case, we have a Spark manifest, which instead of the deployment controller, Kubernetes talks to the Spark operator controller, which knows all about Spark applications. 
you may have noticed that the spec for this uh, manifest is a lot more complicated than the one from the web server, as there are plenty of things that we can specify. For example, we pass in what image we want the, driver, uh, the image to use, what file to run, and the details of the drivers and ex executors, just like we did for the command line. Except this time, it's much easier to read, and if we do need to make a change, it's much easier to see what's changed. So having created this file, what do we need to run it? So you can see that the command line part of this is much simpler. All of that complexity from before is kind of hidden in that YAML file, which you hope is somewhere in your source control. And the other thing to call out is that rather than a Spark native tool like Spark Submit, we use a Kubernetes native tool, Cube Control, to send this job to our cluster. And when we apply this YAML file, which is a Kubernetes way of saying we run the thing, the Spark application is created and our workload gets run. And this should look kind of familiar. There isn't much to see here other than to say, yeah, our job ran successfully. Now, one thing to bear in mind with this is that this instance of Spark UI is actually specific to our application. This is the only job that's in it. And this will actually disappear when the application exits. So if you need to deal with history, you need to deal with that separately. And we'll kind of touch on that briefly at the end. And we can also look at some lower level stuff using the Kubernetes dashboard. And we get a few more details here, including all those things we specified when we submitted the job, the life cycle of the containers that did the work, and so on. And the real kind of takeaway here is that if you already have Kubernetes, let's say for the web workloads or for you know, the all-important microservices, then the management and monitoring tools you use for those could also be used to manage and monitor your Spark applications. Now, in real life, your tools are probably a bit more sophisticated than the Kubernetes dashboard, but you get the idea. We can manage our Spark applications as if they were any other kind of Kubernetes deployed application. Now, we've mentioned images a couple of times without going into too much detail about what they are, even though they are a key part of this solution. So returning to our Spark application manifest, every Spark application, we need to specify what image for the driver and the executors to use. Um, and so we all need to know what a Docker image is. So next, I want to have a look at how these images are actually put together. To explain what's going on here, we need to know that a container image can be built from a Docker file and that a container image is made up of layers. So on the right here, we have a Docker file, but those in the, uh, in the know will know that it's in reverse order from bottom to top. And on the left here, we have the corresponding layers. At the bottom, we have the operating system. Follow on top of that, we build Java, the Spark software, and on top of that, we have uh, optionally PySpark. So this is a, creates a fully functioning image that can be used to run Spark uh, applications. And even better, we don't actually have to write this Docker file ourselves, as the Spark distribution code provides a script that can get us this far um, already. Now, I said that this image could be used to run Spark jobs. However, it's not particularly feature-packed. For that, we might want to add our own dependencies. For us, for our application, we want to be able to read and write from S3, so we add some Hadoop libraries for that. And we also want to use Delta Lake, so we add some libraries for that. We've not got all, we've got a lot of bunch, a bunch of lines missing here, as the, these dependencies will have other dependencies, but we had to get it onto one slide. And this image might be uh, suitable for general purpose use for a team or across a few teams. But we think we can do a bit better than that. We might even want to add our own internal libraries and ensure that all those projects in our team are using the same versions of those internal libraries. Now, this image is probably good for the team developing a group of related applications. And finally, we can add our main application file to the image. And now we have it, our very own uh, image ready to, that contains everything we need for our job. So what's the advantage of this? Well, essentially, the dependencies are fixed, and we say from the knowledge that this container will run the same wherever you run it, whether or not it's in the cloud, in an on-prem cluster, or on our laptops. So having figured this out, we can derive a kind of internal maturity model for adoption of this. So at the most basic level, a team can use that generic image, maybe with just Spark, uh, some common dependencies, Hadoop and S3, and specify all their own dependencies in the manifest so they get loaded at runtime. And this is great, but it does make your startup a bit slower. And those dependencies obviously have to be staged somehow wherever you're going to read them from. Moving on, they might add some more of their own dependencies, that library in the Docker file, so they don't have to be specified every time. And further still, we can build, as Eddie was saying, the job-specific image that contains everything this job needs to run. 
So the advantage is that this is the container as executable. It contains everything it needs to run our Spark application, and it will run the same way on-prem, in the cloud, locally on the desktop. Now, we've only really scratched a small part of this system in this 20-minute talk. There's obviously quite a few things we're skipping over. Uh, we don't really use SQL Server Agent to do scheduling. We use uh, Airflow, which can run in our cluster. Right? Uh, and we don't really use the Kubernetes dashboard for monitoring. Uh, we are using Azure Arc for Kubernetes to connect our on-prem clusters to the Azure cloud. And not everyone can do this. But in our case, there's no personal data going back over that. That's the logging and diagnostic information that you might save locally in the cluster. And of course, we can tie it all together with uh, our source control in Azure DevOps, and we deploy this using Azure Pipelines. So in conclusion, is this a good idea? Well, <laughs> probably not for most people. All right. uh, however, if you're in one of those situations where you have one of those requirements of a start, then yes, this is a good idea. All right. uh, and if you need to, then yeah, this is, I think, the way to approach self-hosting Spark. Uh, this is the last slide. This is the feedback. Uh, there's a prize for filling in feedback forms, I think, every day. There's the link. Right, and later on this evening, there's going to be pub quiz and curry night, I think. Oh, there's another talk before that, though, isn't there, right? Yeah, 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 cool. OK, so we'll see you all around, and we're going to head for the community zone shortly.